Hello, everyone. I'm Sean Mooney. Hello, everyone. I'm Lord Alfred Hayes. Today, I'm Sean Mooney, and we're going to talk about the biggest event of the summer. No, not SummerSlam. We're talking about the G1 Climax 25. We will be joined by Lord Alfred. Take it away. A good friend of mine. Not just a great podcaster, but an excellent dancer. <laughs> the great, strange, bizarre, <laughs> shock on Shan. Shan, welcome to Face to Face. Man, I don't even need to be here. You could do the whole show with just those two voices, and I think that would that would cap everything off perfectly. Very Shan, I really done. don't know what you're talking about. This is Sean Mooney again. I don't know what you mean. It's just me and Lord Alfred in the studio here. We're in Studio B. And we're sending it over to you because you got this big podcast coming up today. And I just wanted to know what you have on the agenda. Listen, my friends, this is a huge week. Lots of stuff going on. Some of it has been covered in, in a certain level of detail. We're going to be jumping in a little deeper. Before I get into what we're talking about today, we want to send out our well wishes to our dear friend, Shinsuke Nakamura, uh, oh. who was injured in the G1 tournament, hurt his elbow. I think there was a lot of question as to whether he's going to be able to fight Michael Elgin uh, in his next match. Let's hope he does. Um, great, great wrestler. Some of them we're absolutely mad about. So, uh, you know, well wishes out to him. Also, we must say well wishes to... Uh his fellow Chaos member, Toriyanu. We will talk about the G1. We've been, we're five shows deep now. There's a show coming up tomorrow as well, tomorrow morning. But we can sort of give our thoughts uh, a little bit. I'll give you the updated, the current standings. But yes, Yano injured um, at the hands of a headbutt from Tenzon. Uh, a really bad, a really bad slice. And to have that happen, and one can only assume he's got a concussion, the first, not even the first week into the G1 when you got a whole month ahead of you. Uh, this is really bringing up some interesting questions. So, yes, the G1 curse continues, and we will talk about it at the end of this show. But, of course, Shotgun Shan, man, you got to talk about who, Lord Alfred? Let me just pull out my wiener. Uh, <laughs> no, Lord Alfred, put that one away. I, I thought you were going to say Hulk Hogan. <laughs> oh, why do I want to talk about that, Jabroni? Um, why don't you talk about him, Shotgun Shan? I mean, it's been a few days removed. Sean and I hit the airwaves. As the news was really coming in, and I think it was all kind of maybe a little bit premature, but now we've had a few days to really soak it in. It's not like uh, there hasn't been more news or more comments or more reactions. Um, I think I think the story is really starting to shape up now a little bit. I mean, it's a kind of a weird situation for a lot of people because it really brings up the the it really brings up the question of what is racism what is being racist there are an awful lot of people who will throw the n-word around and go well i'm not racist and maybe in their minds they really believe they are um hogan's comments were certainly done in a very derogatory nature um you know i mean you can look at Racism in this sense, uh, you know, there's different kinds of racism. There's sort of the casual racism where you throw around slurs and, and maybe a general uh, uh, disdain for a certain race or a certain judgment of a certain race, but you don't actively seek out to hurt them or to be hateful toward them. And some people think that's fine. Uh, I tend to disagree. Um, there's, a, there's contextual racism where people are like, well, I'm not racist, except when I'm around other people that are racist and then I'll, you know, say whatever I feel like. Um, the bottom line here is that we're really having to take a look now at what it means to be racist. And really, I mean, everyone has their own definition, but to me, it's the whole idea that you're going to categorize and judge an entire race of people um, simply based on what they look like or whatever the distinction is. Being, uh, you know, being able to say, well, your skin's this color, so I'm going to look at you this way and I'm going to uh, judge you that way. It certainly sounds like what Hogan was saying he threw around. And, and this is kind of a funny weird thing, too, because I'm not going to repeat what he said. Um, so I have to do kind of like little kid talk. But, you know, effing N words and blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, there's that whole sense that uh, that that and even he said within the conversation that he he said, well, I guess I'm a racist. Now, a lot of people have come forward. Um, Virgil, Kamala, Kevin Nash. A few others to say, I've never heard Hulk Hogan be racist or he's always been kind to me, um, you know, and maybe that's true. But, you know, you have to really feel like when somebody's at their kind of worst moment, which I think Hogan at that point in his life probably was. This was around the same or this was during the same time as the the sex tape it was all taken from the same um, footage. Um that when you're in your lowest, if that's what you're reaching for, those kind of hateful comments and those kind of hateful ideas about people, then in your heart, you certainly do have some racism there. The other side of it is 
is the the corporate obligation of, of companies like WWE. I mean, a lot of people are saying they're overreacting by essentially stripping Hogan from history. I mean, he's still there if you go looking for specific matches uh, in pay-per-views. But there's no mention of him on the website. There's no mention of him in the store. You can't buy his stuff anymore. They've scrapped all of his future merchandise. Um, Hulk Hogan essentially is kind of non-existent now as a presence within WWE. There's even been talk that they're going to take away his Hall of Fame. I'm not sure you can do that, and I'm not even sure that that's the right thing to do. It's their Hall, just to interrupt you just quickly, it's their Hall of Fame. That's not the real Wrestling Hall of Fame. It's the Vince McMahon Hall of Fame. He can do whatever he wants. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah. I'm just saying there's an awful lot of... um, dickheads in the hall of fame and i'm not sure true. that we can we can distinguish that <laughs> this one's no, worse true. than any of the others right honestly um, i think that all came about because they took had to take him off the website completely so they yeah. took him out of the hall of fame section i think that's really where the majority of this uh but i don't have any you know information about that but just when i heard that i thought okay knowing the internet the way i do you know people have jumped onto that because you know mm-hmm. yeah you know, there's that whole thing but yeah i mean he's not there he's not featured in the hall of fame so he's not on the website Period. No, and he's been taken out of the WWE 216 video game, um, which wow. is funny because they'd been they'd been boasting now that this was the biggest roster in history, and I'm sure that they were trying to get all the major players in there. So to have Hogan out of it is going to be interesting. But I mean, I totally see where WWE is coming from. They've got to cut all ties. Uh, the world is a different place now. Some people don't get it, um, and some people do. But the fact of the matter is that, for good or for bad. Um, you know, whether people overdo it or not with their political correctness, um, there's really no tolerance for intolerance anymore. Um, you know, if you're racist, if you're sexist, if you're homophobic, you need to keep those comments to yourself or only, you know, when you're dealing with like minded individuals. And that cannot become a public opinion anymore. Um, you know, by and far, I think that's going to make the world a much better place. But you run into situations like this where you have to kind of look at it and go, well, are they are they overreacting? I don't know. Um, but certainly cutting any kind of public professional ties with uh, with Hogan is is the right move for their for their company. I mean, what are your what are your feelings on that? Well, obviously I agree. And there's more stuff with Hogan. I mean, he's already starting to he's already not playing it cool right now. Like he's trying to act like he is. He's really like going on Twitter and, and he's really um, interacting with the fans, the people mm-hmm. that are supportive of him. He's he's completely screwed from a, a public persona standpoint right now. Screwed. And yeah. you talked about him being taken out of 2K14. Shan, do you have any idea how much 2K16. money? Sorry, 2K16. I'm sorry. I did this last year too, didn't I? <laughs> you did. Um, <laughs> around you this have, time. You must have really liked 14. That's what I could say. <laughs> exactly. But uh, anyway, 2K16. Um, you mentioned him being taken out of that. Do you have any idea how much money this whole Hulk Hogan firing has cost the company? It's not just stuff like that. It's stuff like. Um, you know, there were action figure sets that were just set to come out that now you've got a recall. And, uh, you know, here's the weird thing, man. Here's the weird thing. The week before, like last week, um, I picked up a Hulk Hogan uh, action figure in Walmart. The first one wow. I've ever seen with the boa, my, right? The one with yeah, the boa. No, it wasn't with the boa. It was just the straight, just the normal one in the yellow tights and everything. But wow. yeah, the classic Hogan. And and I was like, oh, wow, Hogan. Well, we don't have that one. We'll throw him in there. Well, that may have been the last chance I would ever get to get one. So, um, you know, it's in there. But uh, what it's cost them, I think they're probably going to play that pretty close to the chest. But I did read the other day that with the um, with the stock dropping after all this happened, that they lost something like fifty million dollars. Yeah, that's that's the number I heard as well. And that's just on the stock. That's not on all the materials that they're going to have to abandon that are in progress, and the stuff they're going to have to pull. And uh, I, I even read that for two K fifteen, where you could actually download Hulk Hogan to add that to the to your game, that they've taken that off, so you can't even get it now um, on the game that already came out. So they're you know they're scrubbing him and they're taking the hit on that. Um, so I don't think that that there'll be any more Hulk Hogan stuff for quite a long time. I, I mean, truly, I truly believe, sorry to interrupt you there. Go, go ahead. ahead. What I was going to say is I truly believe that if this had happened in his prime with those comments made public on the, like, I mean, I know you don't, you're not a traditional cable family, right? Yeah. So you're not dealing with the news all the time. And, and I am because CNN seems to always be on in my house, even though my wife knows it drives me nuts. But, uh, <laughs> it just, it's one of those things. Um, it seems to always be on, just when we're doing stuff, not when we're watching TV, but just when we're doing other things. And, uh, I mean, it's in the constant rotation today. It's, it hasn't stopped. It hasn't slowed down. And if this had been in his prime, I believe they would have fired him. Yeah. 
because of the face of Zidane, because you think, I mean, that was, it's still a, a kid's demographic, but I mean, he was the kid's hero uh, of that era. So, I mean, to have him saying the things he was, even in 1985, yeah, I think they would have had to cut ties with him. It would have killed them to do it, would have killed the bank account to do it. The WWE may not be around today, but I mean, any way you look at it, um, they just can't have that out there the funny thing and i don't know if you've uh, heard about this because again you don't have you know the the cable which you shouldn't because i mean it's a it's such a it's not a very futuristic thing to do to have cable in 2015 yeah. it's it's not very alex shelley and kushida to do that. <laughs> but um you know it's not just the hogan stuff anymore it's the horrible taste of vince mcmahon and i believe 2005 was yes. it and you know where I'm going with this. I do. The segment with John Cena and with Booker T, when for whatever reason, Vince McMahon decided it would be good to have him say the N-word. And now that's all over the news. That's being used in these packages all the time. And you got the Nancy Graces again back on it. Is there a problem with racism in professional wrestling? It's like Still a good question. <laughs> no, it's not, because we know the answer. <laughs> um, so, I mean, Kamala came out and, and defended Hogan, and Super that's that's their yeah. yeah. And that, yeah. but I'm just gonna use Kamala as an example. I mean, yeah. that's his personal relationship with Hogan. But I mean, Kamala's been very outspoken about the racism he suffered in yeah. wrestling, his whole wrestling career. But I mean, definitely in WWE. Yeah. Um, so it's not like Kamala's saying, you know, there's no racism here. He was just saying that Hogan wasn't racist to him I mean, towards him. Yeah, I mean, what I'm saying is I think that there are probably several different versions of Hulk Hogan. I think we've seen them over the years, you know, and I think that, you know, I read a thing by Mick Foley who said that, and, and Foley's not always, you know, always, he's not going to bend over for people to, to paint yeah. them as a good character, but he said that Hulk Hogan was always really kind and good to him and that he really thought he was, he thought highly of him. So that he was sort of struggling with this idea. But I mean, I think again, like I said before, Hogan may have been at his lowest time and that's what he reached, reached for in that moment. He may have been kind in one-on-one, -on -one, um, you know, interactions with the black athletes or black fans, but you know, still may have harbored underneath that. Uh, just, I mean, I think racism just generally is just a weakness of character anyway. So, well, well, and I said, you know, that Hogan's already starting to act up a little bit. He's starting to, not play it as clean as he should be right now. And I noticed that today he retweeted something that was posted from somebody that said, Barack Obama, the biracial president of the United States, uses the N-word less than a month ago and is praised and applauded for it. And Hulk Hogan uses the N-word and he gets fired from the WWE. <laughs> this is seriously something that Hulk Hogan retweeted today. I think he doesn't understand context at all, but um, that's Hogan. Yeah. Then again, we have we have always enjoyed the Hogan the Hogan version of history. I think that I think it would be really great to do a segment at some point. Maybe we do it or get someone else to do it, even as an animated segment. Hogan's history, where we revisit historical events through the eyes of Hulk Hogan. I think that would be pretty funny. But uh, well, let me just um, say this: I, I don't find any. <laughs> I love it, by the way. I, I would pitch it if I had any kind of ins to the TV industry. But uh, you know, with Hogan. Um, you know, I don't want to have any pleasure in seeing a man fall from grace like this. I mean, it's been a slow fall, but I mean, things seem to be picking up for a while there. The question is, how much money did he make when WWE took him back? How much of that TNA money did he make and, and you know, put in the bank? Um, because right now, you're not selling him to any kind of entertainment companies right now, I don't think. He's no. not going to do any kids' movies. Um I don't think anyone actually in Hollywood, even if they tried to completely change his character and make him sort of this dark actor, you can't do that. No one's going to work with him, period. Like, you're not going to have that involved with your movie. Um, you can't. Can you do public appearances right now? Maybe in certain parts of the United States. Um, yeah. Perhaps. Uh, but not if he's going to maintain that he's not a racist. Right. 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 So that's right. That's right. They're not going to embrace ways, him. Right. Right, they're yeah. not going to embrace him. Uh, he's screwed there both ways. So you're not going to – what else could he possibly do? What else can you do? What, what like, does he need to do? Honestly, does he not have enough money to just lay low and well, let That's it... what I'm saying. But, I mean, yeah, he, you're, I... Forget, you're forgetting this guy was broke, dude. That's true. I forgot. He went through that divorce. He got – you know, Linda took all of his money. Uh, he, he didn't have a bunch of money when he came into TNA. He was trying to make money again, trying to get back in the, the plus. 
And, I mean, with WWE, I would assume he got back in the plus. I mean, I know they used him quite a bit and a lot of good merch money. My question is, how much did he save? How much did he blow on beefcake? Uh, no. <laughs> I thought it was funny. I don't know why I have beefcake on Facebook. He's got to be the the dumbest wrestler to ever read anything he's ever written. I mean, I agree. this guy is allergic to grammar. <laughs> it, it, it's just... He he doesn't use a period, a comma, nothing. But uh, anyway, but Beefcake, I guess him and Hogan had a pretty public falling out over the last little while. Beefcake finally lost his meal ticket. I guess Hogan just didn't have the money that he used to have to, you know, be able to ride his coattails. Yeah. Um, and so they had had a falling out. But of course, Beefcake after this said, you know, if you need me, buddy, I'm there. <laughs> Which, of course, you got to applaud from a certain standpoint. But when you know wrestling and you know con men and you know Bruce the Barber beefcake, um, yeah, you know that this guy's probably thinking, hmm, maybe this is my way to get back in with him. Mind you, I don't know. We'll see. Anyway, but my, my thing with Hogan, if you're saying it just among – I mean, this, this is a real thing. We all know this exists. We've all been in that awkward exp- awkward situation where this has happened. Yeah. Um, white people that would say they're not racist, but when they're among other right white people like to talk racist. <laughs> yeah. Because right. they think that they're in their safe zone. And clearly Hogan thought he was in his safe zone. Were drugs and alcohol involved in, in what was going on during the, the making of that video? One would assume. Yes. But again, uh Hulkster just I don't think drugs and alcohol make you manufacture they don't race, make you racism, exactly. Right? Yeah, and so. that wasn't just yeah. That was really serious uh, words that he used and, and very hurtful, obviously. So yeah. Hulkster, I mean, he, he could be in a situation where he needs to get a job. And I, I, mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with that because I think he really he, he really did, regardless of this situation, um, he, he kind of has some really bad karma coming for him. And, and yeah. there may be people that hear this right now and feel like I'm kicking a guy when he's down, but this isn't, like, I mean, this is Hulk Hogan, everybody. Yeah. This is Hulk Hogan. Maybe I don't understand perfectly, but if he's struck up a new deal, he still has money coming in from the merchandise that has been sold, right? I'm assuming. Right. So, right. I mean, it may not be But a there's ton. not going to be any more. Yeah. There won't be any more. So, I mean, maybe. It, and you're forgetting he's in the middle of a big lawsuit right now. Oh, shit. That means legal fees. That's you know? right. Oh, so, man. That again. sucks. Yeah, exactly. I'm not looking to see that. I'm not going to find any pleasure in seeing this guy fall from grace, but I do feel like he has had a lot of bad karma that's been built up. Has he done a lot of good things and make a, you know, make a wish and all yeah. this kind of stuff? Yes, he has, of course. Sure. People are not, everybody knows this, people are not that simple, you know? Yeah. It's not as black and white, pardon the yeah. pun, as, as a lot of people would like to make it out to be, so... Well, and the thing, too, is, like, this is not just about Hulk Hogan now. This is really about bringing to the forefront having people question what's racist, mm-hmm. you know. Very much you, so. Because if you're listening to those comments and going, I don't know if that's really racist, well, then you better reexamine because I think you got some issues. Then, again, it's just my point of view. Do we move on from this, or does there more to talk sure. about? What do you think? I just, on a final note, I just yeah. want to say there's obviously been a lot of misinformation um, regarding the Hulk Hogan story, and a lot of people... A lot of people I know, wrestling fans that like to post on the board and have their own pages where they, you know, talk about wrestling. I'm not trying to be too obvious here, but uh, we're resharing something that they thought this was all about, which was an interview he did in 2012 with um, DJ Who Kid. He was on his show, and Hulk Hogan used the N-word in telling a story, right? And DJ Who Kid same, came out and said, no, there was nothing racist. He was telling a story. You know, I didn't think have any problem with Hulk was really cool. I didn't have any problem with him in the context because, again, it is all about context in the context, saying the N word when telling the story about what someone else said. Um, but a lot of people were sharing that and saying this is a huge travesty. This guy's been fired for telling a story. You know, they, a lot of people thought that the whole Hulk Hogan being removed from history and and everything that was happening and CNN and all that was just based on that interview. And it wasn't. Nobody has heard the tapes Nobody has heard. I know there's even been new things that came out today, new comments that, and there's going to be more. This isn't going to stop. There's a lot more to this. Some people are saying the worst is yet to come, um, but uh, I don't know how much worse it can get. But uh, anyway, um, it, it's something that has only been in transcripts so far. This yeah. has been stuff that has come out through the Gawker lawsuit, through the discovery of this lawsuit, and was picked up by the National Enquirer and TMZ. And uh, they ran with these transcripts. So that's all. Now, who leaked the transcripts to the National Enquirer and uh, and to TMZ, etc.? I mean, who knows? I don't know. But I think a lot of people are pointing at Gawker on that one. 
Um, so anyways, that's the Hulk Hogan situation, everybody. You want to read the transcripts. Don't listen to some audio from a, a, 12, a 2012 interview and think that that's what it's about. And by God, Hulk Hogan is getting the shaft here. No, he's not. Um, they had to do it. Understand 100% why they did it. I can't believe how much money they flushed down the toilet. But again, this goes to show how serious. I mean, we can say what we want about WWE, but we we got to admit they are more serious now than ever um, in terms of protecting their image and really being a PG product. I mean, I, I feel like they've been more PG in the last year than they ever have as a company, you know, ever really. I agree with you, yeah. Because you can't even say the 80s because it was extremely politically incorrect in those days. Oh yeah. So, yeah, let's move on, man. What do you got? Next thing we need to talk about, not as big as the Hogan story, but in my mind, quite significant. Daniel Bryan uh, did an interview not long ago, just uh, very recently with Busted Open Radio, in which he actually clarified why he's gone. Now, we've been wondering for a while. It was never said what was wrong with Daniel Bryan, just that he was not medically cleared to return. Everyone assumed it had to do with his neck. In this interview, Bryan states that his neck is fine, completely fine, is what he said. I'm reading it right here. It's not an issue with my neck. It's more of a concussion issue. So the rumors that we had been hearing that Daniel Bryan was down with a concussion and the WWE were keeping it quiet because of this concussion lawsuit, as it turns out, were true. Um, so Daniel Bryan is out with a serious concussion. So I, I took a little shot at Bret Hart shooting his mouth off about things he didn't understand when he said that Bryan had the same type of injury as him. I apologize to Brett, um, and uh, it turns out that this is true. Daniel Bryan is now out with a concussion. According to the interview, his neurologist has cleared him and said that he's in the, uh, he says, uh, it, the scoring goes bad, poor, fair, good, great, excellent, and he's in the great, excellent levels as far as his recovery, but WWE has not cleared him to return. Now, we can only assume that WWE is being very, very cautious and holding back, Brian says in the interview that he is he's very straight about the fact that he will wrestle again. And if WWE won't clear him, he'll go he'll go somewhere else when it's uh, time. So kind of a significant story. What do you think? Um, I mean, this guy is awesome. That's what I got to say, first of all. And I don't know if you've read his book yet. I've not read his book yet. I have not. I'm it is getting to. it's getting rave reviews and. Even, you know, Meltzer and, and people that would tear it apart in terms of it being fantasy or fiction have come out saying, you know, they were quite impressed with how honest it was. And uh, he doesn't hold anything back about – funny thing is he doesn't hold anything about, back about expressing the exact same opinions that all of us were expressing for about a year. Yeah. Everything that we were saying, everything that people like Meltzer were saying and reporting – pretty much all get completely, uh, you know, verified in this book of Daniel Bryan's. It's extremely straightforward, extremely honest. Um, a lot of really fascinating stories, one of which was very, I thought, extremely entertaining. Um, when he came into NXT, did you hear about this story regarding Ezekiel Jackson? I did not. Uh, they were riding on, a, I guess, uh, no, it was a plane. They were, they were at the airport, and... Uh, Ezekiel Jackson, I guess Brian had the window seat, um, and you know all the NXT guys sit together, so it's kind of like this is where all the green guys sit. You know, this is all the newbies, and uh, Brian had a window seat, and Ezekiel Jackson came over and said, "Which one of you guys are?" I, sorry, I'm actually telling the story wrong. It's before they boarded the plane, and he walked over to where they were sitting, sort of at the airport, and he said, "Which one of you new fucks um, has the window seat?" And which one of you are giving me your window seat, basically. Basically coming up like a bully and saying, whoever's got the window seat, it's mine now. Right? Give me your right. lunch money. Uh, <laughs> and Brian said, I, before he said anything uh, or just asked, you know, who's got the window seat, Brian said, I do. And then he came over and said, yeah, well, you're giving it to me. Not anymore. It's mine now, basically. Yeah. And, uh, oh, that's a kind of a nice little ring. Oh, that's me. Hold on one second, everybody. My apologies. We're live, pal. <laughs> We're live, pal. I tell people not to call me during showtime. But uh, <laughs> anyway, so he comes over and he says, well, it's mine now. And Brian, I guess, had already been having a bad week. It was when they had him on the losing streak in NXT. And uh, he had expressed that he was you know, getting pretty pissed off and pretty sick of it. And he was already considering his options of what he could do and ways to get out of his contract and whatever. So uh, 
he was already having a bad day. So he just took no shit. And he said, you know, you're not taking anything from me. He said, I would have give easily and gladly given this to you if you asked me for it. But since he came over and, and told me that you're going to take my seat, he said, I'm going to give it to somebody else. I don't care about the window seat, but I'll give it to somebody else. I'm not going to give it to you. And uh, I guess Ezekiel was kind of like, whoa, what? you know, whatever. And Stephen Regal, William Regal, was sitting an aisle behind. And I don't think Ezekiel realized that. And uh, Regal just stood up and just tore into this guy. Just was like, do you have any idea who this is? He's got more talent in his little finger than you'll have in your whole body. He's been wrestling three times as long as you have. He's been around the world. He's been to Japan. You've never been anywhere. And uh, this guy is like a son to me, and you need to apologize to him right now. <laughs> like, Regal wow. just totally put this guy in his place. So uh, Daniel Bryan, yeah, did not have good things to say about Ezekiel Jackson. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, from what I'm hearing, I have a really, really awesome read. And, uh, I mean, is there, a, is there a possibility that in some ways he's sort of uh, verifying a lot of this stuff to sort of continue to be the Internet favorite, and that's sort of how they're marketing it, potentially. But, I mean, it's all stuff that was being reported, and he, he seems to be, with everything he does, and, and that would include his book, he seems to be a guy that really just tells it as it is, but not in that CM Punk way. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? That does make sense to me, yes. So, no. uh, uh, Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. So as far as him and this interview, I mean, I felt like that was what we were seeing yet again. Yeah. And every interview I see with him, I feel like he's, you know, the company may not love him for that reason, because he really just kind of tells it as it is. Yeah. And very matter of fact, and he told it very matter of fact, um, it seemed from reading the transcript of the interview that he seemed a little bit bitter about it. Mm -hmm. And he talked about sitting down with Triple H and Vince and saying, you know, this is my passion. If you're not going to let me do it, I've been cleared. If you're not going to let me do it, then I'll go do it somewhere else. Because it's my passion, but just tell me so I can leave. Um, so I mean, he, he he is in a situation where I don't really know what's going to happen next regarding Daniel Bryan. What are they holding him back from? What what medical tests will he have to pass if he's getting an excellent score from his neurologist? What's what is he going to have to do? I know he did mention that he had a. Uh, one, one, one arm or something like that that was weaker than the other. He ha said yeah. it was about 85%. Maybe that's something about why they don't want him wrestling right now. But I don't believe this guy's going to sit on the sidelines for that long. I don't even know how much longer he has on his contract. I'm not saying it's coming up, but I'd be interested to look at how much time he has left on it. And when Daniel Bryan, remember the whole tie necktie incident? Mm -hmm. When he choked Justin Roberts because it was a crazy out of control brawl. And he just thought that's what you do in a brawl when you're, you know, taken over and whatever. So he uh, choked the time or he choked the announcer and got fired for it. This was his very first appearance on raw. If I, if I recall correctly, and he got fired for it and Johnny Ace called him up and Johnny Ace. A lot of people have sort of explained that Johnny Ace was always a little bit smug. So he called them up and he, he sort of broke it to them in this way that he thought like, he almost was finding a bit of pleasure in, br in breaking this news to this guy. And uh, he said, well, sorry, kid. We're going to have to let you go. And Brian's, Brian just flat out said, and this has been recounted by a lot of people that worked in the office at that time, that Brian just said, okay, that's okay. I was making more money before. I'm going to go to New Japan Pro Wrestling. This was, <laughs> this was, this was a famous <laughs> quote that he said. And, I mean, that's not him acting. He, he truly was just like, okay, so I'm gone. That's fine. So I'm just going to call New Japan, and, and that's great. I was making more money before I came here. See you later. And uh, Johnny Ace was just left there being like, "What? You're not even you're not even upset about it?" And he said, "No, no. I, I just I came here. I thought it would be a challenge. Um, you know, something I hadn't done yet. That's why I came here. I was making more money before. I have a lot of different options, and I'm cool. Don't worry." <laughs> so I mean, that's, awesome. it, that's that's Brian, and I feel like that will be Brian again. I feel like um, if he had not held back and again he the reason he didn't go at that time was because he had a lot of other bookings um in the united states and in canada at that time that he was able to take uh, and then wb if you recall he really wasn't gone very long before they called him back and said okay we'll bring you back and they brought, and they him, brought back him back at SummerSlam. at SummerSlam. so he wasn't on the shelf very long but he already had talks with new japan they wanted him they were just trying to figure it all out and put it all together um, I, I feel like that would happen again. Do I worry about his body if he happens to go back to Japan? Uh, yes, but he's been there before, and I think he'd be there again. He's been very open about he, you know, he watches the G1 every year and everything with Cesaro. 
Uh, those are the two guys that like to watch the, the G1 every summer. So uh, whether he goes back to Ring of Honor, with, the, the, the landscape would be he, completely open for him. He could do what he wanted. He could write his own ticket um, if he becomes a free agent. Um, but will that happen? I don't know. Does he want to conquer WWE again? Or is he at a point right now with WWE where he feels like it, you can only go down from here? Yeah, I mean, maybe that's the – it really is going to be interesting. It may be more them – having to fight to get him back than the other way around, because I think Brian's already been shown what they're going to give him and it may not be enough this time around, but let's keep our fingers crossed. I just, I mean, the, the part of this story that just really grabbed me was the notion that they were, WWE would not come out and say he had a concussion to me. That was, yeah, I was like, well, that's, you're pretty worried about this concussion lawsuit. So um, then he also said though, that he wants to be back for the Royal Rumble uh, 2016. Yeah. At which point I thought, please no. Do yeah. not come back before the Rumble. Please, not again. Because <laughs> yeah. you know that they're going to have somebody else that they want to win it, and the crowd's going to want you, and it's going to cause this whole BS to happen again. So <laughs> how much time, I'm looking at the clock here, how much time do you want to spend belly aching about Undertaker and Lesnar? Oh, only a minute. <laughs> okay. Only a minute. Look, buddy, I just... Go ahead. You've got more than a minute. I just haven't I just, I haven't talked to you since Battleground, and I'm not here to belly ache about it. I'm absolutely I am. not. Just, just let me let me... Let me present this and then you can, because I'm just interested to think, see what you're going to say. Okay. Um, you know, obviously Battleground, it was a good show. It was a good show. There were some parts of it that left me feeling a bit sad, a little bit off. I, I guess I didn't realistically think Kevin Owens was going to win this feud, uh, but I hope that he would. And they certainly kind of capped it off with him tapping to... Uh, to uh to Cena and kind of ending the feud that way. You know, my fear is that that was sort of the best we're going to see of Kevin Owens for a while. I hope it's not he's going into a feud with Cesaro. Um, although the concern there is both these guys need a win. So I, I guess if they just tear it up and do a long feud and everybody gets to show what they've got, there's some benefit there. But yes, Undertaker and Brock Lesnar. I like the fact that they've managed to bring Undertaker back. I do not think putting them with their top draw, where Taker needs to redeem himself in order to not look like a fool, is a very good idea. I Taker does not need it. Brock is hot. Keep Brock hot. Do not have him be running away from a 50-year-old Undertaker. I don't think that does anything for his uh, for his image. I thought the brawl was fun and everything, but the bottom line is how does this play out? Because if Taker just comes back and beats Brock, then you threw away the the you threw away the streak for nothing. Um, and you've also kind of taken the legs out of your top draw. I mean, I, there was a time when I would roll my eyes thinking at the idea that Brock was the top draw, but these days I think he's really proven that he's he's in it for the long haul, and um, I think you need to keep him clean. If they do some kind of chaotic match between the two of them, and it just has an indecisive ending, but Taker holds his own and lasts till the end, so be it. But please, please don't have Taker come back and beat Brock because you're just shooting yourself in the foot. What do you think? Okay. Two parts to this answer. Okay. First part, yeah. I mean, the pay-per-view was fine. Like Sean Cunningham says, everybody worked hard. Uh, <laughs> that's what. <laughs> everybody deserves a participation medal. <laughs> um, the girls' match was surprisingly good. Nick or uh, Bree stood out like a sore thumb. Yeah. Poor um, Bree. She was had her tongue out, just wrapped around her ankles. I mean, she was just completely uh, the odd woman out, you could say, in that match. Um, as far as the Owens thing. Good again, good match, really good match. I feel like this feud. I think I've, I'm I'm gonna bellyache about this. The fact that that feud could have gone six months to a year. Instead, it was wrapped up in two months. Yeah. Because that's the WWE on crack fucking way of booking. You know, let's let's yeah. give you this storyline. Um, you know, on speed, and that's what they did. And now, where's Kevin Owens? Kevin Owens is one of the jabronis in the opening segment of Raw trying to break up a fight between Brock Lesnar and The Undertaker. Sorry to sound repetitive. I said it on Friday. I'll say it again. What the hell does Kevin Owens' character care about Brock Lesnar and Undertaker having a fight? Exactly. Does he think the universe is going to come to an end? <laughs> like, why would he have any investment at all in breaking up a fight? This is fight Owens' fight. Yeah. So, I mean, you saw it very clearly. And people want to try to debate this, and people want to try to uh, say this isn't the case, but it is. Vince McMahon is now demoting Kevin Owens. Yeah. He's now mid-card for life, or who knows, not to say for life, but for right now, he's mid-card for now, let's say. 
He's going to work Cesaro. We love Cesaro, but we know where his position in the company is. So Kevin Owens, who was like really the hottest heel in the company, I would say second after Rollins, but there's no way that Rollins can can hold a candle to Kevin Owens as a heel or a talker. As a worker, okay, uh, that's about all. Um, so Kevin Owens was the hottest heel in the company. He shot, he gave this like shot of adrenaline into the roster when he came in, was having great matches. Um, and now he's had his little run with John Cena in a big position, and now he's going to sort of f- have to fight his way back like everybody else because that's where everybody else is. Um, they're in that mid-card abyss, you know? They need to bring in abyss and put him in the mid-card. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so that's my take on that feud. Good, again, good match, not as good as the last match they had and n- definitely not as good as the first match they had. Yeah. They've gotten gradually worse, in my opinion. They gave Kevin Owens everything they could, though. I will say that on that night. Yeah. Uh, but then in one night, they just kind of took his character and chopped his balls off. Regarding Taker and Brock, um, I thought it was terrible at the end of, of, of the pay-per-view. I thought that was really bad. I thought it was everything that was wrong for Lesnar right now. I thought that uh, obviously the crowd loved it. And so from that standpoint, I guess it was a success. You know, there's times when I say, you know, it doesn't matter what I think. It matters what the people think. And, and I'm not necessarily in the the majority with my opinions. But people loved it. They were happy to see Taker. Great. Could you imagine how much more happy they'd been to see Taker if he didn't come back and wrestle Bray Wyatt and completely ignore the fact that Lesnar ended the streak? Exactly. Secondly, why is Taker upset? Like, he's supposed to be this big baby face legend. And he's given Brock a low blow. And he's coming back, and it's like it's like Lesnar beat you clean, dude. That's what yeah. you need to remember. You got beat clean. Yes, I guess that's not what the feud is about. He's upset that they keep bragging about it. They haven't but, bragged about it barely at all in ages. If they were, if he was mad because they were bragging about it, he would have come after Lesnar at Mania when they were in the same building. Do you know what I mean? Right. It kind of just take makes uh, Taker seem like a bit of a wuss, and kind of like he's got a thin skin, and not really not really what you even want to do for Undertaker. With that said, go, yeah, you want to say something no, about go that? Go ahead, go ahead. With that said, the next night on Raw, if you just ignore context and you ignore, ignore significance and you ignore the fact that there's only three stars in the company, John Cena, Undertaker, and Brock Lesnar, um, if you want to just look at that as a segment or as segments, that whole thing with Taker and Brock was brilliant. It was brilliantly done. They paid attention to all the details, the announcers running for their lives when Brock Lesnar came out. It it came off like two real big bad dudes that wanted to fight each other. And, yeah, it sold SummerSlam for the people that want to see that, which is the majority. And and I 100% will will give props to the the performances of Brock, performances of of Taker on that night in the segments. I thought it was like the best pull apart I've seen in a really long time. But that's all it was. Like, you can enjoy it for what it was, but if you really want to start thinking about it, yeah, I mean, this is not good for the company, but I've given up on the idea of any of these guys ever being like Taker or being like Brock or being like John. Um, I, <laughs> it's going to happen when it absolutely has to happen, everybody. I say that for you and I, too, because I know we're going to continue to do this to ourselves. Every time it seems like somebody's getting pushed, it's like, oh, change is here. It's not here. It'll be here when it absolutely positively has to be. When John Cena becomes a big movie star, because his movie's out right now with uh, Amy Schumer, and he's getting these awesome reviews. You don't think that scares the shit out of Vince? Uh, I would think so. I would think so. I mean, that, again, even though Cena's transitioned into a different position, and you know that they're they're doing all their stuff with NXT. Um, it, there's still so much just hanging on John Cena as their big star. And there's just weight. There's always been way too much. Um, so, yeah, I would think that every time that Cena reaches beyond WWE and gets um, gets praise for it, I would think Vince gets a little bit nervous. What's sad, too, is that you're going to reach a point where these legends like Taker, Brock, um, Cena, who, again, he's going to be – who knows what will happen with him? He's young enough that he can have a movie career right now. Um I don't know if you've seen the. Have you seen the commercial for 2K16, not 14, uh, with uh, <laughs> with the Terminator? I know I'm kind of going oh, off here on a sidebar. Terminator. <laughs> I, I know it's ridiculous. It's absolutely horrible. It's uh, as bad as the booking for that uh, under or Triple H Sting match at WrestleMania. Ugh. But the trailer is hilarious, and I gotta say, if you're looking for somebody that really can carry an acting segment and really carry um, perhaps a movie career after wrestling, you ha- look no further than Dean Ambrose. I know that shouldn't be news to anybody, but he was the star of that trailer, and he came off like 
okay, you could do a new Terminator movie and just he doesn't have to be any kind of a what do you call it, droid? No, not that's Star Wars. Cyborg. Yeah, he doesn't have to be any kind of a cyborg or anything. He'd just be Dean Ambrose, and it would be like a really good top villain to face, you know, the Terminator. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, that's what I just what I wanted to say. He's somebody that's good and, and could have an acting career. But John Cena, he's having this love right now um, from his appearance in that movie. And God, man, when you're Cena, you got to be at least thinking about the idea of moving on and doing something past wrestling. And yeah, he, he's got the big enough name and awareness, I think, too, that it would be might be a little bit easier than a lot for a lot of guys, you know? Well, and the other thing too is, is if he continues with the, with the tactic that he's been doing in WWE um, these days, he's going to be having more physical, more demanding matches. Yeah. And not good. He, not good. Yeah, good for us. I have to say, I have loved some of Cena's matches lately, but all I'm saying is for a guy that's getting up there and has put the, put the miles on one day, something's going to happen that you can't come back from in three months, or you can't come back from in eight weeks, or you can't come back from in a year. You know what I mean? Yeah. And when that happens, I just think that I just think that then it's that last minute scrambled. And, and sorry, and... I didn't I didn't actually finish my point too. The fact that, that no, but you just gave me a good uh, transition back into it. The fact that you may reach a point where the the legends that are left that can still wrestle are not going to be able to wrestle when it's time to give the rub to somebody. So you're going to have this whole roster of guys that were mid card forever that are damaged goods. And all of a sudden, all the legends are going to be gone. Anyone that was like an actual star that could give them the rub and put them over the way wrestling really truly should be, in my opinion, uh, they're going to be gone. And it's like, well, how do we start now elevating guys? How do what like what ideas? And I know you and I, if we really brainstormed and Sean, we could come up with some cool ideas that would probably elevate some guys and whatever. But this is WWE, first of all, and it's not going to be that easy when you don't have any stars to kind of piggyback and turn a guy into a top guy. You know, you just, you're not going to have it. And I just, I'm kind of scared when that day comes. Oh, me too. Me too. And it's coming closer and closer. I mean, you've even had your failed experiments with Roman Reigns, who I think is still Oof. coming along nicely, but he, he's far, far away from being a guy he's, that you can do anything with. He's finished as a top guy, in my opinion, man. And yeah. it's not his fault. No, like, I they, agree. They've given up on him and they're about to put him with Sting. And it's like Sting's going to be the, ste the scene stealer of all that shit. <laughs> Roman Reigns is going to be like, what was Hogan's uh, sidekick? A good side. He's Roman Reigns is going to be Hillbilly Jim. Uh, that's true. Because he can't. Sting is actually a very charismatic guy in a lot of ways. Like when it comes to when you compare him to Roman in terms of a wrestling promo, Sting's going to blow him out of the water. And Roman's just going to be the guy with the wet hair standing beside him just like, I'm Hillbilly, I'm Hillbilly Jim 2015 with, <laughs> with the riot the gear hair. on. Yeah. Oh, so, poor and this is not a knock on Roman. They didn't handle him right. It's all on the company. It's all on the company. And we were saying this all along. Like, I mean, we were. this is what we were worried about happening. This is what we were warning the company about. This is what we were talking about after the Royal Rumble. And everybody labeled us haters. Everybody said, oh, you're just, you're not willing to give this guy a chance. Who are you to say when a guy's ready or not? Where are we now, folks? Where are we now? Roman Reigns is in purgatory with the rest of the mid-carders. And, the, and fans, no, the fans truly are not connected to him. They're not. And through no fault of his own, I don't think. I think, okay. I think Roman gave everything he had, and I think he gave more than was used properly. I just think that it didn't turn out the way they wanted to, and they soured on him and said, well, we'll just go somewhere else. Right. Although where they've gone, I don't know. I don't know where that push went. They could have, say. and they could have just let him go out there and talk in his own words. But yeah. no, we can't because we have to read the script word for word. It's very important. The people will know if we go off script. Okay, we can't. We can't have the people tell that. Oh my God, he just went off script. Um, because <laughs> but, they all have copies of it. Yeah, we all. We all get. Uh, you, you still get that, right? You get that sent to your email. I do. Your uh, Yahoo or no? What, I'm trying to think what the old, what was the oldest email possible like. I don't. I don't know. AOL. Man. You got it sent to your AOL. I got to send it my AOL. My AOL. My AOL still gets it. You're right. So before any WWE programming, we get the script and we read along with it. That's part yeah. of the fun of watching wrestling. You read along with the script. Yeah. And then if they go off it, you say, "Oh, you messed up." It's like those old read along books with the CD. Yeah. Where Tinkerbell rings her bell, and you know it's time to go to commercial. The people but, can tell. The people can tell. But anyway, uh, so they, they didn't treat Roman right. They didn't bring him along right. So that's my take on that. And uh, you just may reach a point where, uh, I mean, they they should have already had the stuff of Taker putting over somebody young, you know, like some, like, I mean, it's fine what they did with Lesnar. It was a big surprise. It got the mainstream coverage, all that. 
Um, but he should have already had the big moment of making somebody young that was good. And Triple H has done things along the way, but he's never fully, really made a guy that was young and said, you know, and like recently, I mean, I mean, he did with Dave. I think Dave would be the best example of a guy that Triple H did because he actually did. But I mean, that was Dave and he was all jacked up. And and where did that push go in a lot of ways, too? But yeah. uh, anyway, so so. I guess that's my take on the WWE stuff. It's been fine. There's been some good matches. 2015 has been awesome six months for wrestling and from all companies. With that said, we're no further along, people. And yeah. Rollin, th- Rollins is not doing it for me. I, I think if I think if you were going to do an extreme, extreme kind of transition here, it would be a matter of WWE sitting down and making a list of their stars. And saying, who are our stars? And I mean, we say there's only three, but I mean, there are guys who are lower level stars. Who are our stars and who are their equivalent in the younger, um, younger talent? And put these guys together for the next six months. And let's just start, you know, rubbing some of this, uh, some of the, the shine from these, these established stars onto these younger guys and make it a directive. They really haven't made it a directive. They've done it here and there. But I think the time is now, really. To start doing that and say, who's the equivalent in in our in our current crop of future guys? Who can we make the next big guy? Let's make them right now. Yeah, who's the next Undertaker? Yeah. You no. Know, who's the next Lesnar? Who's the next Cena? <laughs> well, I guess they have been doing that, but they just like, come on. Yeah. You know, exactly. come on. You're not going to find another John Cena right now. No. Well, they John Cena. John Cena was made. Okay. I mean, yeah, he had talent. But he was made. He was produced. He was, yes, he was. You're not going to find a John Cena because John Cena was a different guy before they got a hold of him and, and molded him into what they wanted him to be. They just need to do the same thing with somebody else. Mm-hmm. Um, That's true. I think we're done WWE, are we? I, I would say so. I would say so. But just as a nice transition, because I posted a, a funny video to our Facebook page. Yeah. And uh, I've been getting some people inboxing me about it saying, what, the, what is this from? And I don't know what the hell it's from. But... Uh, it was a little bit of a video of Jushin Thunder Liger up to some kind of little pranks. And <laughs> he was, I, it, it, I guess, basically, that's the joy of being the one guy that doesn't drink and doesn't, you know, and engage. Because uh, a lot of his, his co-workers, Tanahashi and Togi Makabe and, and a few others, I think Hanma, uh, went out for a night of drinking and wanted to try to catch a little nap, I guess, while at work in the morning. And Liger was going in there and with a referee. And trying to get the quick pin on them. <laughs> and uh, it's a really funny video. Uh, some guys, even in their sleep, kicked out um, at 2.5. Like right with the near fall there. I think Togi Makabe did a near fall there uh, in his sleep. Uh, he went. He goes in to see Hanma, and Hanma doesn't have pants on <laughs> or <laughs> underwear on. And he realizes there's a camera, and he gets very embarrassed, and he's trying to cover up his genitals. And uh, <laughs> And it's some kind of like a prank show, like candid camera type show, I guess, in Japan. And Jushin Liger was on it. So uh, I just wanted to quickly get your thoughts because I don't think we've had you on or we've done a vintage since uh, they announced that Liger would be coming in for the Brooklyn Takeover show, which will also be running, and this is no coincidence, the same night as the Field of Honor show, also in Brooklyn from Ring of Honor. And we'll have... uh, Kazuchika Okada on that show. We'll have Shinsuke Nakamura on that show and Kushida. All three of them in Brooklyn the same night that Liger is in Brooklyn. And um, there's been a lot of talk. Dave Meltzer has talked very extensively. Uh, Mike Johnson has talked extensively. A lot of people have been talking about this. NXT, the new initiative, or at least now they're just being more upfront about it. The new initiative, shut down Ring of Honor. Operation shut down Ring of Honor. Uh, what do you think about this story? First of all, um, obviously we're super excited that Liger is going to be on the big stage right now, especially because he's a guy that we're kind of just even more hyped about after seeing him just a few months ago. Uh, but what was your first reaction after hearing he's coming in? And, and clearly, with the fact that he's facing Tyler Breeze, that just tells me somebody saw that match with Dalton Castle. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking too. And they want something like that on their show. Jeez, man, they should get Dalton Castle. I love Dalton Castle, but that's an aside. Listen, um... As soon as I heard that, my stomach kind of got into knots a little bit, um, and and not because I wouldn't want to see Liger on NXT, but Ring of Honor, I think that they're struggling a little bit now. I don't know if you heard, but um, you know the the early 
the early uh, um, eight o'clock, yeah, eight o'clock show has been cut now. Mm-hmm. Um, they're still on TV, but I think that the second show's at eleven, right? So that's not yeah. exactly prime time television there. Um, so I mean, they're struggling. I I I watched their Death Before Dishonor eye pay per view the other day, and it was an outstanding show. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really want them to do well. I think WWE going into Target Ring of Honor is just a little bit like. It's a bit of bullying. I don't think they need to be stomped on. I think they're developing some great talent. And if you want to take their talent, that's fine. Um, but uh, it made me a bit nervous. And, and um, yeah, I, I'm i feeling a bit uncertain. I'm very protective of Ring of Honor. I have that sort of personal connection with them just because it's really the only show that I'm really, really into on a regular basis now. And we have that great live event. So I'm feeling kind of protective of them. And I'm feeling a bit worried. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Me too. Me too. And I thing too, and that a lot of people are talking about, and I completely agree. But it's WWE, and they've done it in the past, and they'll continue to do it. With the territories, obviously, they shut down a lot of places that could have been cultivating talent for them, right? Like, yeah. I mean, they, that's where they were stealing all their talent from was AWA. So clearly, AWA knew what they were talking about and had an eye for talent. So why would you want to shut down AWA, or why would you want to shut down all the companies that they were shutting down at the time, which was everybody? Actually, AWA was one of the ones that lasted the longest. Uh, the whole goal of shutting down everybody when you could have them cultivating more stars for you to sort of cherry pick at the time, it just seemed very short-sighted. In a lot of ways, it was, because the guys like Piper and Hogan and all them, I mean, they only were around for, they really weren't around that long in WWE when you really look at it. Uh, they went on to WCW and then they kind of did the old fogies tour. Uh, but the run of Hogan, I mean, he didn't make it 10 years in WWE during that Hogan run. He didn't make it 10 years. Uh, I think he was, he, he started in what, 84 and then for that run anyway, and then he was gone by 93. So, I mean, they could have had a lot more Hogan's and they went through that horrible drought of not having a Hogan and going in a different direction, which for wrestling fans in ring, it really worked out better. The fact that they had the steroid scandal and they wanted to kind of have more realistic bodies and they thought, okay, here's Bret Hart. That would be a good option to put in there as our new, you know, face of the company. That would have never happened during the Hogan era. Bret wasn't going to be beating Hogan. So, um, you know, uh, it's it's one of those things. They're, they're going to be shutting, trying to shut down Ring of Honor. They have all of the power in the world to do so. And this is what's scary is that them – you know, setting their sights on Ring of Honor, that, that's a scary thing to have happen. It's one thing when TNA's looking at you. It's one thing when, I don't know, Lucha Underground's looking at you. It's another thing when the big bad giant is looking at you because they can do whatever they want. They can go into the building and say, we'll give you such and such more to put us in there. They can go in there to a TV company and say, we'll give you our show for the same price. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> you can have WWE for the same price, WWE NXT for the same price as Ring of Honor if you want. You know, we'll be that generous. And then, of course, who are they going to take? Because that's a much bigger affiliation, obviously. I don't, um, I don't know what the benefit is of shutting them down, though. I well, just don't see, I don't see where there is a crossover where WWE is losing anything from Ring of Honor. I just think Ring of Honor picks up the scraps from the diehards that want even more wrestling than what they're getting through WWE. I just don't see that there's I don't see that there are any kind of a threat to them. Well, look at the roster right now. Look at how many guys are Ring of Honor guys. And, of course, they worked all around the world and they got... You know, a little bit of this and a little bit of that from all kinds of different places. But really, the place they were given their shot, the place that they were given their exposure in North America was Ring of Honor. And that goes for the world champion right now as well. Uh, So it's like they obviously had the eye for talent. And it just saves you so much trouble if you just let them build up the talent and then steal them. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think as WWE, that's what you're supposed to do. But to actually want to shut down their ability to make these stars for you, I don't understand that at all. Um, but that's what the big bad bully does a lot of the time, and, uh, and it's what they did in the past. And basically, you say, why? What's the crossover? The crossover is NXT is Triple H's baby. It's the new. It's going to be a touring brand. It's going to be the new, I guess, like the secondary brand to WWE that's going to be uh, touring around the world and, and doing all these different places and, and touring around to all the smaller buildings. And who is the fan base of NXT? The internet-based fans. So that makes Ring of Honor competition and public enemy number one and that's your answer and uh the the new japan thing you know obviously loyalty is a really huge thing in new japan it has been forever i mean they won't work just to give you an example um and this goes to show how there is something going on here because ring of honor is their partner 
they don't have exclusivity over New Japan. Nobody does. New Japan's a much bigger company than Ring of Honor. Ring of Honor needs New Japan a lot more than New Japan needs Ring of Honor because when New Japan comes and they put their stars on the show, the draws are bigger. When Ring of Honor goes over there and, and Michael Elgin or whoever or, or whoever they bring over, Red Dragon, is on the New Japan shows, it doesn't draw an extra person. You know, they don't need Ring of Honor. Ring of Honor needs New Japan. And loyalty is a big thing. And this goes to show you because they have a relationship with CMLL, who is the rival company of Triple A, uh, who will be putting on a pay-per-view. I don't know if you heard that. They'll be having North American pay-per-view distribution. And one of the big matches on that show, Rey Mysterio versus uh, Mystico, now known as Mystici. So you'll get to see that match for the first time ever with English announcing here in North America. But they have a relationship with CMLL, New Japan does, and they will not work with AAA, who is the competition, and they won't let their guys work with anything involved with AAA. For instance, Lucha Underground. They can't work Lucha Underground if you're a New Japan guy because it would be stabbing our partner in the back. Now, with Ring of Honor, clearly, I, I don't know. We don't know yet for sure that uh, Liger, because he does have a, his ability, um, an ability to book himself independently, but we don't know if it, if that particular deal was 100% New Japan saying, have Liger and let's work together. But clearly there's been something going on. They don't reference Ring of Honor on television by name. Kevin Owens talks about my many battles with Sami Zayn. They don't say Ring of Honor. New Japan, they have no problem saying, we saw the Beast in the East. They were saying, New Japan, New Japan, New Japan, giving all this information, IWGP this and that. Kidani, who is the president of New Japan, who we saw at the show in the very pimp white tracksuit, Kidani's a huge WWE fan. Gato, the booker of the company, is a huge WWE fan. They obviously want to work with WWE. The, the, you know, the money that they're going to be able to get from them, as opposed to Ring of Honor, is a lot more. The exposure into the North American audience, which they want, is going to be a lot bigger. And so it looks like you know loyalty may not be a factor in this particular situation. It's almost like the deal's just too sweet for loyalty. So... I don't know. I I'm gonna yeah I'm gonna hold my breath on this one because I don't want to see Ring of Honor take a hit at all. I think they've got a great product that's that's unique and it's I just it's so set set apart from WWE that I would love to see both things survive. Sure, and and really with regarding the Ring of Honor and the New Japan thing, I believe there will still be an involvement for right now. Yeah. Um, I just think it's gonna be one of those things where they're gonna have to be competing with WWE, who's also gonna be trying to book them, yeah. trying to be trying to book the New Japan guys and trying to lure them over. To working with them more uh so again well again you really are smart to hold your breath because it's hard to know where this one will will end up landing but there's clearly some kind of involvement um new japan did do a press conference as well saying they're now involved with wwe they're now involved with nxt um so again we talked about it i think like a week before the story broke about how wouldn't it be funny in a fantasy world if yeah. the wwe guys and started showing up at the tokyo dome or like this this relationship for wwe would be awesome you know, it would be, and it would be good for us in a way as fans to be able to see that. But I, I just, I worry about the repercussions. Yeah, and I worry about them being involved. Yeah, <laughs> I, I worry do. about them being on NXT and the crowd going nuts because you know they're going to go nuts for Liger in Brooklyn. Yeah. Hardcore yeah. wrestling fans. Um, I, I worry about them getting really over and bring in Shinsuke or something for one show, and him yeah. getting super over and Vince being like, "We need to get this guy on our show." And then, as soon as you start doing that, that's when it's a whole new ball game and. It's going to yeah. get real political. Those kind of relationships usually don't last very long, usually because the guy's not getting booked from the other company the way that they had agreed on, etc. Yeah. So we'll have to wait and see. But, yo, G1 Climax. Okay, uh, myself. Well, look, look, before we get into the G1, I've got a transitional spot here that's going to fit in really nice Perfect. between our WWE talk and our G1 talk. Now, as you know, Jeremy in the tech department handles all of our emails. and. Yeah. I know. And he does a good job, by God. And I'll tell you what, there's been a bit of a misunderstanding here because every week Jeremy sends me a little report of all these emails that come in. And I had assumed that he'd been a answering them. And it turns out that he hadn't. He'd just been telling me that they were there. So to anyone who's been sending us mail, I do apologize. I've pulled two really important, well, I think it's not important, significant emails to, re to read on the air and to do a response to. They both pertain to both WWE and New Japan. And one, I think, is, raises a really excellent point. The other one is just really, I think, more for entertainment purposes. But let's start here. Jim Lowenthal sends us a letter that says... With Hold on, what's his first name? Jim. Jim, okay. 
Jim Lowenthal sends us a letter that says, with WWE and New Japan seemingly getting uh, more involved as time goes forward, do you think that the G1 tournament will influence WWE in any way? TNA tried their own uh, points-based tournament, um, with it, which has had limited results. Do you think the WWE, WWE fan extent, attention span could support something like a G1 tournament in WWE? Mm. I, like, I, I, like anything, it's reconditioned. Okay, do you want to answer first? No, you go ahead. It's just, all I'll say is I'm, I'm not as concerned about what the fans would think as what Vince would think. I don't think Vince has the attention span for it, but you go ahead. I know for a fact he's been pitched one of these tournaments before. But the G1, the difference between the G1 and the TNA, I mean, tournament that they tried to do, uh, first of all, is 25 years of history. Yeah. Um, second of all is a reputation for it being the best pro wrestling of the entire year uh, for an entire month. I mean, there's no way to compare that. And TNA always has to make things way too complicated. Whereas the G1, I was trying to explain it to Matt yesterday, and I was getting ready to give this long explanation and kind of have someone look back at me with a blank stare because sometimes that seems... Wrestling fans are really used to just the single elimination tournament. Anything else is like, whoa, 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 you know, my brain's going to explode. Um, I started explaining it to Matt, and he actually was explaining it to me by the end, you know, because he, he got it right away as a sports guy. He was like, oh, yeah, it's like a league. It's like, you know, there's two blocks, and each guy's got ten, you know, there's ten guys in each block, and two points for a win, and one point for a draw, and zero for a loss. Okay, that makes complete sense. Uh, and then, the you know, A block winner fights B block winner. It, it's, I say it, and it doesn't sound complicated to me. Matt heard, heard or sorry, Ernest heard it. Shit, he's not even hearing him saying it. Ernest, okay, Fabe, wink, wink heard it and uh totally got it right away a lot of fans i've tried to explain to they automatically are like i don't know what you're talking about and i think vince when he was you know presented with that idea of doing something similar to that had the same exact same reaction to it Uh, it's like anything though it's just a matter of conditioning your audience to it i mean the g1 started 25 years ago in 1991 it didn't start in the ancient days of civilization you know it, it was 1991 and from 1991 to 2015, I mean, the people in Japan, they get it 100%. They're, they're not confused about it. It's just normal to them. Uh, the single elimination, Vince doesn't even like doing single elimination tournaments. So my answer to this guy, Jim, is Vince doesn't even like doing single elimination tournament. Do you think he's going to do a point-based block A, block B tournament? Smart I, enough. Yeah, I Smart would say enough. No. I would say Dumbass. No. I, uh, oh, now, come Sorry. on. If you thought Jim was a dumbass. Dude, wait. Jim, Jim is my sound man, okay? I'm looking at him as I say it. Okay. It's, because... it's a fake last name, but I know who sent it because he's, he's asked me this question before. <laughs> so one last time, Jim, and I'm looking right at you. No, Vince wouldn't go for a point-based tournament. So let's move on and, and don't bother Shan because he's getting backlogged enough as it is. Go ahead. Look What's at, the second com- one? Compared to Jim, this next guy. Yeah. Okay. This one I'm reading for entertainment purposes alone and simply because he calls out Luke Force in it at one point. Oh. This is from RKO Kevin 94. I can only assume that's not his real name unless his parents had some kind of issues. RKO Kevin 94 says, and I'm going to read it as it's written. It's written in sort of bad grammar and spelling mistakes and slacker shorthand, but uh, I'll try to make it translatable. Okay. Wait, could he be Brutus Beefcake's son? It could be Brutus Beefcake himself. Who knows? Okay. He says, Ed Leslie. He says, why you guys always talk about new Japanese when it's lame and no one watches it anyway? I tried to watch it once and couldn't understand what they were saying except <laughs> Brain Buster. Why do they keep saying hi to each other all the time? It's annoying. They must have said hi 500 times and it made me turn it off because I thought they were stupid. You think watching New Japanese makes you cool, but you're lame. Luke Force doesn't know nothing about... No, Luke Force know, knows not, no, doesn't know nothing about wrestling... Because if he did, he would only watch WWE. Oh, That's from RKO Kevin this 94. This is not RKO Kevin 94. This is Luigi Tyrone. And uh, I I know it? what he's trying to do here. Yes, it is. I can tell it is by the way he, you know, he's trying to disguise his grammar a little bit and make it just <laughs> a little better than it usually is. But come on, man. I know that's Luigi. But I'm not even going to answer that because there's a, there's a certain little tone of, of Hulk Hogan racism in there, first of all. And I don't like that. I don't like anybody undermining the Japanese people or the Japanese community here in uh, Toronto or anything like that. I, I'm very sensitive about that. They're great people. Uh, you know, 
buzz do you, off. Do you, do you think this guy is being racist, or do you just think he doesn't understand that high means yes in Japanese? Well, he doesn't understand anything. <laughs> he He's also know. calling the calling the company New Japanese. New Japanese. So I think, I think, yeah. But I thought Kevin RKO Kevin ninety four, we got your message. Uh, if it is if it is someone undercover, well, you know, we'll deal with you separately. I've been but. watching WWF since nineteen. What do you think, Shan? Nineteen ninety. 1985 or Probably, earlier? Yeah, no. I think 85. 85 yeah. I go back to 85, Kevin. How long have you been watching? You think that you know all the WWE and you think I don't know anything and I only know new Japanese? I challenge you to a trivia contest. Write in your answers if you can spell them. And that's right. So, Kevin, you write back to us and you either say no or hi, okay? Yeah, say no or hi because <laughs> I don't want to hear any more of that crap. Now tell us more about G1. Okay, okay. Let's obviously I'm not going to take you through all the shows. There's been five of them. Oh no. But uh, but I will just talk about some of the big things that have happened. On night one, AJ Styles defeated Shibata in the semi-main event and received his first two points. Really cool match. Um, obviously you picture those two styles, right? You picture Shibata's style, which we've sort of praised on this show many times, and then you picture AJ Styles. And they had their stare down at the beginning, and I actually got that feeling of I am. So scared for you, AJ. But AJ didn't seem to be showing any fear in his face. Uh, AJ is so goddamn confident, man, right now. It's actually scary. Uh, there was a moment in a match with Torianu. So, yeah, he beat, sorry, he beat Shibata with the uh, Styles Clash. There was a point when Shibata had a, had a choke in, like the choke sleeper that he does from behind, but he couldn't lock it with the other arm because AJ was fighting it. So he just put his, his own hand in his mouth and locked the sleeper with his mouth. So oh my he, God. Once again, Shibata's mouth becomes uh, one of the big stories coming out of a, a good match. So uh, <laughs> anyway, so him and AJ had their, their big match. Uh, or not a big match, but it was their first match. AJ wins. But uh, he had a match with Torian a few days later. AJ did. And again, that's an interesting clash of styles there. But there's a, a spot in there where he is, is I don't know, he's got uh, Yano down a little bit. He's got him, kicked him in the gut or something. And uh, somebody in the crowd says, hey, AJ, John Cena. And then AJ just hits the ropes, comes back as fast as anything, hits a big drop kick on Yano, and goes back to that fan and says, John Cena can't move that fast. Uh, right. So he totally has this awesome interaction with the fans and everything. Um, but anyways, back to night one for just a second. The main event, Tanahashi versus Kota Abushi was the main event. This is a match that I just dream about all the time. It's one of the things that I think about when I'm at work to get me through those long days. Tana versus Kota, how will that match be? Uh, it was a great match, really, really good uh, Tanahashi, I watched this with Ernest, too, and he thought the same thing. It was a lot of shades of Bret Hart in terms of you have the two squeaky clean baby faces who go into a match, and one of them has got to sort of turn into a bit of a prick through the match, and that was Tanahashi, and, and he had the facials, and he was being a little bit dirty, the way Bret Hart would be. Uh, Kota Ibushi uh, missed a, almost missed, this goes to show you how awesome he is, he did that big springboard uh, Hurricane Rana onto Tanahashi was standing on the top rope, but he missed his head and it would have been a big botch except he overshot the head and actually scissored his arm. So he did a Hurricane Rana on his arm and that looked pretty awesome. Uh, but then in the end, he missed the Phoenix Splash. Tanahashi hit the high fly flow and defeated Kota Ibushi. And, I mean, they just beat the shit out of each other. They had all kinds of great crisp spots, all kinds of awesome stuff. Everybody hit. Tanahashi's out there wrestling like it's 2011. He's hitting everything. High fly flow to the outside. Incredible match. Um, Kota Ibushi afterwards tries to get up for the handshake, falls down. Tanahashi gives him the pat on the back, you know. So real, real awesome. Um, Tana had a huge celebration afterwards. He did the guitar, the guitar routine. Um, the fans all throwing, have you seen this where they throw the towels at the guy and he, he puts, you know, soaks his sweat up with it and gives it back. Have you seen this? I have not seen it. That's cool. Okay. So he, he's walking to the back and everybody has the Tanahashi towels, everybody. And they're throwing, you know, throwing them towels left and right. And somehow he's keeping this all straight and he'll soak his sweat up with the towel, throw it back to the right person. And, uh, then he, you know, looking for the other guy, throws that one back. So he just basically was like drying himself off with all these towels on the walk to the back. So he was like over like Rover in that match. So awesome opener, uh, opening day for G1 in terms of the main events. Um, other stories that have happened. Um, interesting. Guess who is coming out of this tournament so far is in one of the leads here. A guy that you wouldn't have expected with a win over first night, Shinsuke Nakamura, second match, uh, Haruki Goto, the Intercontinental Champion, Carl Anderson. 
Really? Carl Anderson getting clean wins over both Nakamura and Goto, which tells me that Carl Anderson will be uh, at some point challenging for the IC belt. That's what that tells me. So, again, the G1's fun because you really never know what's coming. Um, So Anderson has four points right now, so that was kind of interesting that he won over those guys. Other big stories throughout this uh, tournament, let's talk about Naito for a few minutes because Naito has overnight, and this has got to be one of the cooler heel turns I've seen because it's so different. Usually a guy, you can kind of sense it coming, but to truly turn heel, he, like, has some big cathartic moment, right? You grab Marty Jannetty, you throw him through the window. Uh, you beat up, you know, your tag partner, whatever. Naito showed up from Mexico after being there for, like, a month or a couple weeks even. I think it was, like, a couple weeks. Naito comes back, and he's a dick. He's got these facials and this smirk, and he does everything slow, and he's lazy, and he lays down. He'll like leave the ring and go lay down in the aisle for a while. Uh, he's bored. He couldn't care less about the fact that he's in there wrestling. But it's like he never did anything wrong. He just started wearing a baseball hat, being cathartic, or not being cathartic, uh, being lethargic, I guess you'd say. Yeah. And uh, and there was the match he had at the last pay per view where he was Hanma's chan- or Hanma's partner. Nothing had happened. Like they hadn't had a real big blow up or anything. And uh, Hanma's getting jumped by the Bullet Club while Naito's just very slowly making his way down to the ring. Like, couldn't care less. And he sees it, and he doesn't care. And it's like the whole story right now is what has gotten into Hanma. And so he has had this uh, real, like, partnership. We talked about, you know, sidekicks and everything with Hogan and Hillbilly. He was like Tanahashi's sidekick for a long time. And and we saw them as tag partners, and they've had matches before, but they were always very sportsmanlike. Brutal, like, you know, they they beat the hell out of each other, but it was always very sportsmanlike. And so uh, from yesterday's show, which I watched with Ernest, um, the match with Tanahashi and Naito, which was the main event of that show, uh, Naito is now wearing this, essentially he's become the war insider. He's got the uh, metal mask on. He wears a black suit, which he very slowly takes off, and everybody's like, come on, let's wrestle. The crowd is booing him, which they don't boo anybody. They're booing the shit out of him. He still hasn't really done anything other than he didn't, you know, really back up Hanma, but they hate his guts. Because he's such a dick, and uh, he has this match with Tanahashi. And they, they start the match off, and Naito spits right in Tanahashi's face. And whatever, they have the match, they, they do all their stuff, and it's a lot, of, a lot of strikes, a lot of forearms, a lot of uppercuts. It reaches a point at the end of the match, Shane, where it's gotten so heated that they will do a few punches. Naito will spit at Tanahashi. Tanahashi will punch him a few times. Tanahashi will spit right at Naito. There was a point where they were having a spitting contest, <laughs> in the middle of the match, spitting at each other. And it got so heated, and the crowd was just reacting like, oh my god, what has happened with these two friends? But nothing has ever really happened. He's never done anything where he jumped anyone or he beat anyone up or anything. So they're having this match. It gets really heated. Then it kind of dies down a little bit. And everyone's like, okay, there's going to be a little more match, and then we'll get to the finish. Out of nowhere, Naito hits this move that didn't look like a finish. It was like this uh, sliced bread, a standing sliced bread almost, sort of like the Ultimo Dragon's old WWF finisher, WWE finisher. Yeah. And it was like one of those moves where you get a few like claps, and then one, two, three. And yeah. in a lot of ways, people would look at that happening with anyone else and be like, well, that was kind of a stupid finish, or they sort of timed that out wrong, or that match already peaked. The way it happened was just like the whole crowd went like, <gasps> what? He just won with that move in the middle of the, the middle of the ring, clean over Tanahashi. The referee comes over to raise Naito's hand. Naito wants none of it. He he puts his hand, you know, he like does the whole thing of you're not raising my hand, and then pushes Red Shoes down and starts laying the boots to him. The crowd's oh. like, what? Nobody beats up Red Shoes or or Tiger. Like they don't get beat up. He just starts beating the hell out of the ref. Um, for no reason, grabs one of the young boys, Jay White, the the white kid with the mohawk. Throws Jay White out of the ring, runs out, starts pounding him. Naito flipped, so he finally had his moment of like, wow. And then he stood over Tanahashi, he was still selling like for like five minutes in the ring, laying there. And he came in and he was like standing over him, put his foot on him, and being a such an asshole. And the crowd was just going so crazy, just oh, we hate you, you're such an ass. So that was really cool, and that's been an awesome story uh, going in the G1, the whole transformation of Naito. Another I, match, sorry, go ahead. I, I thought he was so entertaining when we saw him live, so I'm glad to see that they've taken that personality and given him, you know, something even more to do with it. So that sounds like he's poised to be one of their big 
heels now, which would be great. It definitely feels that way. I think he's going to be... He has not had a world title reign yet. Uh, he won the G1 two years ago, which was kind of a big upset, and was like, wow, Naito's going to be... Uh, you know, voice for greatness. He went in and he fought Okada at that Wrestle Kingdom uh, two years ago, and he lost. So he's not yet won the Intercontinental or the World Title. But yeah, after last, after yesterday, yesterday morning, geez, they got something in store for him, and it was it was really good. And again, a totally different kind of heel turn, and just went from being an asshole to now he's actually doing things that the fans are just like, this is unforgivable. So anyway, really cool. There's also a match yesterday, um, AJ Styles versus Kota Ibushi too. And we had talked about that on the air when they had their first match at Invasion Attack and kind of ooing and aahing over that um, combination. Uh, another great match and a lot of scary spots from Mabushi. I won't tell you too much about it because I think you need to see this one for yourself. But some really, really scary stuff from Mabushi in this match. AJ is AJ. He's confident. He can just work with anybody. Uh, great chemistry with these two. Um AJ never did hit the Styles Clash on Kota Ibushi. He did go to hit the uh, Springboard 450, and Kota got his knees up. And Kota Ibushi hits the top rope. Phoenix Splash, one, two, three, gets the win over AJ Styles. So uh, Kota Ibushi now has lost one and one, two. And so uh, th- that was really the big story, other than Shinsuke Nakamura, as you say, injured. And he is the favorite to win this thing. And, I mean, I've heard a lot of things for months that he is the guy that they had planned to win this thing. And so this really could throw a monkey wrench into uh, Gato's immaculate long-term booking. And, and, uh, and, and again, if, if, if the story was that he was going to go and he was going to win the title at Wrestle Kingdom and, and he's going to get his little reign as world champion for a while. Can, can I ask, if you miss a match during the G1 tournament, what happens to you and your opponent? As far as, like, does that match get rescheduled? Is he well, going to get the chance to make those points back? Because it's not just him. No. It's the guy that the people right. that have missed out It fighting. screws up everything. Because yeah. these, these aren't just a bunch of matches thrown together. This is like Gato's baby every year. Yeah. It's like Pat Patterson with the Royal Rumble back in the first 10 years of the Royal Rumble, except times 100. Gato has this thing completely planned out. Even within the first week, you can start to see, ooh, I can tell the stories that they're going to tell in this tournament. It's cool. But, yeah, there's a long-term plan for everything they do, and... and uh, if Shinsuke is the, the centerpiece of it all, what does that do? And he has, just to clarify, he has not yet missed a tournament match. Uh, okay. He was, uh, because the way this works is um, it rotates. Like one day, like yesterday, for instance, the big show with uh, Tana and Naito, um, that was the A block that was being featured in tournament matches. So the way the show goes is the first half of the show is all multi-man matches. And it involves people from the B block that are not in tournament action that night and say like preliminary guys, juniors, that kind of stuff. They're all in the first half of the show. Then we do intermission when we come back, five G1 matches. So for anybody watching and you don't have time to watch, you know, the three hour show, et cetera, go to past the intermission and everything after that is G1 matches. And that's what's important. The tag matches, they might do little things to kind of tease this guy's fighting this guy, you know, tomorrow or whatever. But for the most part, it's missable. You don't need to, it's good stuff. It's solid. You don't need to see it. Um, so save yourself some time because the G1, obviously, there's like so much to watch in a month. So just watch everything past the intermission for the G1 matches. So one day is A block. The next day they flip. So then say on Tuesday, tomorrow, it's going to be all the A block guys like Coda, AJ, all them uh, in the multi-man matches in the first half. They might build a few angles here and there, but for the most part, it's just matches intermission and then it will be b block so that's shinsuke and, and ishii and uh and okada and michael algan so so that's the way that's going so shinsuke on yesterday's show that he missed that was a multi-man match he would have missed it wasn't anything to do with the g1 tournament so, so let's keep our fingers crossed then. right like he's so he's not going to miss anything significant and thanks to uh our friend deathlock um on twitter she didn't tell me that what they said earlier in the show, because um, I tuned in a little bit late, and I don't understand Japanese, so double whammy there. But she said that what they mentioned uh, with the little disclaimer at the beginning of the show was that he hurt his elbow, but will be back on Tuesday for his G1 match against Michael Elgin. So right now, anyway, I don't know if they're just copying the WWE and trying to keep everything under wraps, or maybe they really don't know. Um, but other big injury was, was, yeah, the stuff with Yano, really gruesome. And uh, Tenzon, everybody was saying it before he started. I mean, he shouldn't be in this tournament. He's too old. And uh, he, he just he, he's not able to get – he's going to have a good match here and there with a Tanahashi or someone. But for the most part, he's just going to bring the tournament down. And um, he went up to that top rope, and he did not look comfortable, like Ernest said to me, you know. 
He said, I don't think he's comfortable up there. And I said, you're probably right. And he kind of fell off the top rope and head to head with Yano and Yano was split really bad. He was losing a ton of blood. Um, and also Tenzon was also split across the head. Both guys head to head collision to the point where they were, sl- you know, completely just busted wide open. So one would assume that's two concussions. Now, what does that do? Because I know that Kota Ibushi last year of the, of the G1, he missed the whole G1 because of a, a concussion issue. So now you take maybe those guys. Obviously, they're not going to win, but they're still playing a part into this immaculate booking. So this is the problem with the G1. <laughs> it's awesome in theory, and, I mean, it's, it's a great month for wrestling. But when you have these guys that you are depending on to, for a whole month to tell a story and somebody gets hurt in the first six days, you know, that's, that's a problem. So let's hope Shinsuke is okay. Let's hope Yano is okay, period. Uh, yeah. Whether he can wrestling it just it sucks because you know you're looking at the, the calendar and you're like fuck i gotta wrestle in two days exactly yeah so well and plus i mean with all these different you know, players in play having to bring this whole thing together it just must be a nightmare to book around it now even if the guy's not out for the whole thing he has to say he's going to miss two matches again like i guess i just don't know and you didn't know either. that's a what forfeit happens if you miss no one. no it's a forfeit so but, you but, get you get a zero you get a zero, but you're so what happens to your opponent? They get he gets the two. Oh, he gets the two. Okay, he gets All the right. two, and you get the nothing. Okay. So let's say Shinsuke, they don't know, or they're thinking he will be okay, but he needs another few days. He's gonna have to forfeit a few matches. You get too far behind in points. That's gonna screw up the story that you're telling of him being at least at the finals, if not winning. So, yeah, yeah this is where this thing gets a little complicated. And usually, a lot of years it runs smoothly. And um, last year, obviously, Ibushi had to be out of it, but at least he was out before the thing started. Um, I think they had pretty big plans for him last year, but this year, who knows? I mean, the thing is, is that although Nakamura may not win or may have to be, God forbid, pulled from the tournament, you still have a ton of guys that you could, you know, and you have to change everything around, but I mean, AJ could easily win this thing. Yeah. Kota Bushi could easily win this thing. Uh, Naito now could easily win this thing again. Tanahashi's only ever won one G1, and he's been just incredible uh, for these first uh, five matches. He's just been old Tanahashi. Like you would not know at all that he had the bad neck, the bad back, etc. One guy too, just before we get out of here, that I need to put over is our local G1 entry. <laughs> the guy that everybody was clowning on. The guy that everybody said, why is he there? Should be Roderick. Should be Lethal. Should be whoever else. Uh, ACH even. Um, Michael Elgin has had now a few matches. One in particular with uh, Okada, where Okada gave him a lot in this match. And uh, i got to be honest, and I think most people are kind of agreeing, even if they don't want to. Michael Elgin has been very impressive. I know this is his um, dream to be in New Japan. And he connects with the Japanese audience in a way that he never has in North America. And I find that pretty fascinating. It's almost like he was made to be a Japanese wrestler. They love him. They've already, He's already won them over with his style, um, the way he interacts with the fans, the noises, the faces. So Michael Elgin is, is sort of the big surprise coming out of the uh, the G1 so far because Elgin, uh, although he's got zero points, has made a real impression. So good for him, you know. Oshawa I mean, represent, brother. When we saw him at a, at the the New Japan Ring of Honor show, you know, I did feel badly for him because it wasn't even that he put on a bad match. It's just that the the card was so stacked and he was right in between. Um, you know, two of the biggest matches. I don't think the audience was into him as much. But, you know, good for him. I see him on Ring of Honor all the time, and he is a very impressive wrestler. So good for him that he's found his place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not not seeming out of place at all. So here's the current standings. For the A block, AJ Styles, four points. Hiroshi Tanahashi, four points. Tetsuya Naito, four points. Katsuyori Shibata, four points. Kota Ibushi, four points. Bad Luck Fale, four points. Bad Luck Fale. Togi Makabe, two points. Hiroshi Tenzon, two points. Uh, Torianu, two points. Doc Gallo, zero points. Now in the B block, Carl Anderson, four points. Kazuchiko Okada, four points. Tomohiro Ishii, four points. Uh, Hiroki Goto, two points. Yuji Nagata, two points. Shinsuke Nakamura, two points. Uh, Satoshi Kojima, two points. Tomoyoki Hanma, zero points. Michael Elgin, zero points. Yujiro Takahashi, zero points. So there's a show tomorrow. Will Shinsuke make it back? I look forward to the match with him and Elgin if they can pull it off. If not, I think we'll know a lot more and we'll have to maybe do a show next week or, or later because uh, we'll know more definitely regarding Shinsuke and, and whether he will be continuing in the G1. Right now, they're saying yes. So let's just assume that's the that's the up and up. So anyway, Shan, thanks a lot. How, what are you and the kids and Nikki doing to keep cool this uh, week? 
Well, you know, it's going to be really, really hot. All I'm saying is thank God for the AC. Um, okay, you know, I, nice. I'm working. I'm stuck at the computer here, so I'm not going anywhere for a while. But maybe we'll maybe we'll get a chance to hit the beach or hit a swimming pool sometime soon. What about you? Yeah, we're looking for somewhere to swim. Um, I have a client that has a pool and has said we, m- me and Kelly could come by any time to go swimming. So that may be what we do either today or tomorrow because it's just going to be absolutely brutal. I think it's going to be up to 30 today. Um, then you add in the humidity, it could be more like 40. So it's going to be basically to put it in do the right thing terms. <laughs> Forecast for today, hot. hot. <laughs> So, Shan, you take care of yourself. You stay you cool, too, my brother. You always do. And uh, we'll be back to talk more about the G1. We'll be back to talk about the way things shape up in the Hulk Hogan story. Because, as I say, a lot of people are saying the worst is yet to come. I can't imagine. But we'll have to be here to cover it. And thank you, Shotgun Shan, for uh, doing all your updates on the page and everything like that. And doing your thing here on Vintage Update. Thanks, buddy. And you know, shots fired here on RKO Kevin 94. Let's see if he has anything to say next week. Challenge. Uh, so from myself, from Shotgun Shan, from what was Jim's last name? Jim Lowenthal. Okay. His real name is, is Jim Johnson. And oh, Jim. not that Jim Johnson, not the guy that makes the WB themes, but uh, <laughs> just Jim. Just Jim. Just Jim. And, just uh, Jim. If you get any more emails, he does. he's not smart enough to actually change his first name, too. He thinks if he just changes his last name, nobody will put the two and two. He's really assuming that we're just mental midgets. Um, so anyway, um, from myself, from Shotgun Shan, from all the humanoids that like to write in, we want to say peace, love, wrestling, audio, revolution. Get well soon, Shinsuke. Promotional consideration is paid for by the following end. Yo! Yo!